What is going on, everybody? Welcome to this Monday edition of the Pipe Bomb Wrestling Podcast. I am your host for this episode, the Young Buck Andy York. Thank you so much for tuning in and listening to us each and every week, whether this is your first episode, whether it's your 100th episode. Uh, we really appreciate you tuning in and listening to us each and every week. For those of you that are looking at our beautiful faces on Bodyslam.net's YouTube channel, we appreciate you uh, hitting that subscribe button. button. There we go. Turn on the notifications, like, share, all of that fun stuff. Um, if you're listening to this on Apple Music, on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google Play, basically wherever you listen to your podcast, make sure you give us a five star review. Share it with your friends as well. Uh, that way it helps the podcast and it helps grow this wonderful community that we are trying to grow together. As I said, I am your host for this episode, Andy York, and I could not do this old school episode alone because it would be basically pointless because I have no idea kind of what is going on. I am joined by the OG host. I think is that uh, that's what we established last time. The OG host of the Pipe Bomb Wrestling Podcast, Chris Belcher. How you doing, man? Man, I'm doing good. And listen, for for those of you who have been wanting us to cover something old school, like something old, <laughs> old school, ladies and gentlemen, for the first time on the podcast, we're covering something from before I was born. So not yep. just Andy, before I was born. This is going to be fun. I'm excited. <laughs> I'm not going to feel left out this time. So that's, No, that's not at be, all. <laughs> that's going to be nice. Um, but yeah, we are, we're going to be talking about the main event. Uh, we are talking about the most watched wrestling pay-per-view wrestling show whatever you want to call it of all time um okay. which is kind of baffling to me but also going back and watching it for the first time i realized oh it's it makes sense i kind of I understand why yep um so i'm going to be learning on this journey as well because i only know about the the first main event with hogan and uh andre with the the body slam um which wasn't necessarily the first time they've done the body slam but i think it was the first televised body slam Right. Um, that got a massive pop. Obviously, is a center fold of WWE today. Still, they show it in every opening video package and everything. So it's obviously etched in wrestling history. But this is the fallout kind of from that. This is the rematch of that. So we're gonna dive into the entire card. Um, dive into the entire show. Um, kind of going match by match. But we're also gonna focus on you know mainly the main event of the main event, which is fun to say um so kind of <laughs> starting off um obviously you like you said this was before both of us were born um when was the first time that you've actually gone back is like when's the first time you actually sat down to watch this rematch between hogan and uh andre and basically the whole entire show itself i think the first time i ever watched it <clears throat> excuse me was around the time when the network came out because I wasn't born when this happened, until the network came out, I really didn't have the resources to go back and actually watch it. Now, the video, I'm sure, was floating around on YouTube, so I'm sure that I saw the uh, the double ref and the finish and that kind of thing. So I'm sure that I've seen it, and there to be shown it a couple of times or whatever, but being able to actually go back and watch the undercard, like you mentioned, Macho Man versus mm -hmm. the Honky Tonk Man, and just this whole thing and the way that it was all set up, because I wasn't a huge Hogan fan, if I'm being honest. You know, a lot of people, WrestleMania 3 is one of their all-time favorite manias. I, no, not me, not at all. Um, not really a Hogan guy, I was way more of a savage guy. So this main event show, I think it happened in February of 88, if, I, if I'm correct on that. I think so leads up to WrestleMania 4, which is where the Macho Man wins the tournament for the vacated championship. So being a Macho Man fan, I was aware of how this all got set up. And then obviously when you watch WrestleMania 4, they show this to kind of set up how we got to the vacated championship and that kind of thing. So I was certainly aware of it, but I would say the first time I actually watched it was when I had access to it on the network. Uh, I got you. Okay. Well, <clears throat> I'm kind of glad you brought up the, the undercard portion because I, I want to stop there and talk there for a little bit. Um, this is actually one of the first few times that I actually have sat down to watch like the Honky Tonk Man from mm -hmm. promo uh, entrance and ring. Yep. And I didn't realize how like freaking awesome his gimmick is. <laughs> like yes. his, his gimmick is really impressive. Yep. Uh, even like today, like I, I think... Obviously, we have some modern takes of the Honky Tonk Man with Elias, and you could even, to an extent, say Jeff Jarrett was yep. 
was definitely um, modeled after the Honky Tonk Man in a lot of ways. But I yep. honestly, like the Honky Tonk Man's promo before the match backstage was so funny. Yep. And so crazy and absolutely awesome. And then his music hits, and I've heard his music before, but just to see the chaos that ensues with him dancing yes. in the ring, obviously you've got uh, um, the Mouth of the South. Uh, Jimmy Hart. Yeah, Jimmy Hart with him. Uh, you also have his girlfriend who I don't Peggy Sue. Pe- yeah, which you, is... Fun fact, do you know who Peggy Sue is? I do not. Sensational Sherry. Really? Yep, that's Peggy. Oh my gosh, that does yep. not shock me. It does shock <laughs> me, but it doesn't shock me at the same time. Um, yep. Wow, that's that's crazy. But I honestly like I, I loved everything about this first match between Randy yep. Savage and the Honky Tonk Man because I like when you think about '80s wrestling, you don't think about necessarily the in ring work a, mm. a lot of the time. It's definitely character heavy, character based, all of that stuff. And obviously, this was, but. Yep. The honky tonk man could go, and um, obviously yeah. we know we know Randy Savage could go. So like it was, I really enjoyed this opening match between the two of them. Well, I think what um, you were talking about honky tonk man's character and how good he was and all that. You have to remember this was in '88, and he was in the middle of his long reign as the Intercontinental right. Champion, which would come to an end and at SummerSlam of this year. So he still had quite a few months to go, mm-hmm. but this is '88. Elvis Presley died in 77. Right. So we're at almost at the 11 year mark of this. And Elvis was such an icon that people hadn't forgotten about that, obviously. Right. So you have a guy coming out pretending to be Elvis and being a heel. It just, it just rained the booze down on him and the hate on him even more. So that really, and plus, like you said, he was really good at it. You know, he, he had the Elvis suits and he pretended to play guitar and he had the sideburns and you know, all this, that, and the other, he was really, really good at it. So I think the Elvis portion of uh, him not being gone for that long really helped get the heat for honky. Yeah, I I completely agree. Um, One thing I will say that kind of bugged me uh, about the, the print, not the presentation, but they had to figure out the audio situation during yep. Randy Savage's promo because it was so, the honky tonk's music was so loud over everything. Yep, I don't think I understood anything Elizabeth said. I don't understand anything that Randy Savage said. You don't um, understand Savage anyway, so right. Why? So when Let's there's music, it, it made it made it a lot harder to <laughs> kind of decipher what he was saying. So that that's well, one thing. Fun fact on that specifically, I listened to the main event podcast, uh, the episode that Bruce Pritchard did about this. Uh, Mm -hmm. I think it's like episode 80 something or other is way back a couple of years ago, but I went back and I found it and I listened to it as I'm preparing for this show. And he actually addressed the audio situation. He says that the way that everything is recorded now, everything is on a separate track, you know, because we had that technology back then. They didn't have that. (laughs) Right. So it was kind of flying by the seat of the pants and they couldn't adjust the, the audio to match, you know, what was going on because most of those, even though that pre-tape of Savage in his interview was pre-recorded, they still weren't able to get everything adjusted in time right. and that kind of thing. Right. Yeah. That was just one thing that I was like, wow, this is, yep. It's going to be difficult to hear backstage promos between all of this, yep. but um, the match itself was great. I, <laughs> I really love Ventura on commentary. Um, right. The entire card. I love, I really love the beginning because I think Vince on commentary is definitely a shock to like somebody like me that is used to Vince not being on commentary, being behind the scenes, you know, everything like that. But to hear him on commentary, yep. he was not that great of a commentator. <laughs> he was, see, he, see, he, was he not, wasn't, he wasn't great, but it's nostalgia for me. Right, like, exactly. Hearing yeah. him on commentary, it was like, oh, this is great. I love having Vince <laughs> on commentary because he has not commentated a match since 1997. Right. His last commentary was before Survivor Series and right. Montreal Screwjob. Yeah. So what was weird for me was not that Vince was on commentary, but that we didn't have Gorilla Monsoon on yeah. commentary. That's what was strange for me. Yeah. But I love the fact that Ventura on, because like, 
they went through, which I love the opening segment of like how the show started off with the different yep. promos and like the green screen, the obvious green screen behind everybody and mm-hmm. Hogan being a big Hogan. oily boy that he is, um, <laughs> <laughs> you know, flexing and everything else. And, and then we cut to Vince and we cut to, to Ventura. And I love Ventura's commentary of like being the heel in the eighties, but like playing up to it so well yes. um, to where, a lot of heel commentators can be, especially today, a lot of heel commentators can be extremely annoying. Like yep. extre- Michael Cole's heel run is one of the worst commentary things. Absolutely ever. awful. Absolutely, Absolutely awful. Like, ever. Yep. But when you have guys like Ventura or, I mean, ten, Jerry the King Lawler to an extent more in the 90s than modern day his modern day run was not that great but his when he was a heel in the 90s was absolutely amazing paul Heyman, obviously on commentary um grill monsoon on commentary it's like there, like there's so many great heel commentators and i think ventura is right up there especially with what we saw in in this episode specifically yep i completely agree and then we're gonna we're gonna see that as you just alluded to later on when we talk about the end of the night and how they sell that and jesse ventura like you just said is, is spot on especially with that <laughs> yeah i absolutely love it so um kind of obviously you have the match well kind of still on the undercard but you have the match between um honky tonk man and randy savage um kind of walk us through you know like, like you said you're a randy savage fan more than basically anybody else in the 80s and 90s you were a randy savage fan sure um and so other than john michaels but like what like what do you think of this match is it because obviously i think it's it's to me it, it seemed like a really strong match but what did you think about the match as a whole plus obviously the finish and everything else um kind of walk us through your thoughts on the specific match well it was what it needed to be um they're obviously as i mentioned before we're heading into wrestlemania four and the macho man is going to win the world heavyweight championship in that tournament so the idea is to make macho look strong and what better way to do that than have him beat the Intercontinental Champion? Not for the belt, obviously, because, right. you know, that's doesn't change hands on a disqualification or a count out or whatever. But, man, finishes in the 80s were, <laughs> and even in the early 90s were so much different than they are now because yep. you, it was a count out finish. But listen to the pop that the Macho Man got for winning by count out. Yeah. So in the fans' eyes, it's almost like the belt didn't matter as long as right. their guy won. So right. Savage won, and they got their point across heading into uh, heading into WrestleMania. Now, I was always like growing up, I was always I won't say skeptical, but I understood when my guy did not win by pinfall or submission that he didn't win the title. So. I was more disappointed than the casual fan. (laughs) But what we got to remember is this is the first time, get this, Mm -hmm. this is the first time that wrestling has been on prime time in 33 years at this point. First time. So they're absolutely appealing to the casual fan. We had a big casual fan versus hardcore fan discussion (laughs) back on Wednesday's episode, but yeah, they're a hundred percent appealing to the casual fan. This is the first prime time. Think about that just to give context to everybody, um, especially for maybe younger listeners and for Mm -hmm. the young buck prime time means that that channel was available in every single household. You didn't have to have a special cable box satellites weren't a thing streaming wasn't even thought of at this time <laughs> so to have a prime time spot on a friday night on nbc huge huge yeah for the wwf huge yeah so um the way that this came across you had macho man protecting elizabeth being the strong upstanding guy <laughs> you had the honky tonk man being being the cowardly chicken heel I mean, yeah. I thought it, it it worked great. It went over exactly the way it wanted to, and obviously, just propelling the Macho Man to the championship. Right, because like you said, SummerSlam that year is when the Honky Tonk Man. I forget how long his reign actually was, but it was four hundred and twenty, like twenty three days or something, something like that. Something like that. Yeah, I yep. I don't think it's been surpassed since. Mm-mm. Which is nope, crazy is that nobody has held the Intercontinental Championship. Macho for Man actually um, had the record before Honky, 
and right. he had it for like 411 days. Um, yeah. And then Honky got it. So Macho Man dropped it at WrestleMania 3 to Ricky Steamboat. Ricky Steamboat dropped it to the Honky Tonk Man at some point in 87, and now we're in the middle of Honky's run. Yeah. Um, Honky Tonk Man has to go down as one of, if not the greatest intercontinental champion of all Absolutely. time. I think, I think Chris Jericho obviously is up there as well, um, being an IC champion. But I, what the Honky Tonk Man did in an era dominated by guys like Flair and Hogan and Andre to be the guy that held the intercontinental championship is amazing. Like it's yep. really, it's, it's honestly amazing that he was the one because yep. it's not like the intercontinental championship was like a forgotten about belt kind of like it is today. Right. It was like, it, it meant something in the eighties. And so for him well, to yeah. hold it is, is ridiculous like that. And everybody talks about how the Intercontinental Championship is the workers title. You know, you think yeah. of Shawn Michaels, you think of Mr. Perfect, you think of Bret Hart, Razor Ramon, Jeff, right. Jarrett, Chris Jericho, like you mentioned, you know, the list goes on and on, but then you say, okay, well, who was the longest and who was the greatest? <laughs> the well, that guy, it, was the, it was the Hogs dunk man. Right. You know, and part of right. that probably had to do with his best friend being Hulk Hogan, but yeah. you know, whatever. But I mean, to be fair also in, in the Honky Tonk Man's credit, he he held up his own in, in the ring. Yeah, he, and, like, did. he held up his he held up his own in his gimmick and yep. he obviously you know, like the, the famous saying in wrestling is no reaction is the worst reaction. He was getting the booze that he wanted to get. Yep. Um, and so it uh, honestly, it worked perfectly for him to kind of have that long intercontinental championship reign. Yep. Obviously Randy Savage is the one that takes it from him. Um, and nobody complains about Randy Savage winning the intercontinental championship because right. he's Randy Savage. And right. My, uh, my wife who is newer to wrestling than I am, obviously like not even a year in she, before we even got married, knew who Randy Savage was just by, the slim she knew him as a slim gym guy and <laughs> and so i think that kind of goes to show the just that massive impact that you know this era of wrestling has had yep. on just entertainment and the media and the world today like it, it's crazy yep. that that that's that that that's what it's kind of had sure, um absolutely so obviously like you said this leads towards um SummerSlam uh, that year obviously between the two of them with Randy Savage winning the title. No no no. Um, no. So so no, what this, happens yeah, is yeah so at least the SummerSlam but Savage wins the World Heavyweight title at WrestleMania. At WrestleMania. So yeah. SummerSlam rolls around and Honky Tonk Man drops his 420 some odd day reign <laughs> ends in about 12 seconds yep. to the Ultimate Warrior at SummerSlam That's right. That is right. That's the travesty that happens here. Yes. And then Warrior yeah. goes on to feud with Rick Rude for a little bit. He drops the title to Rude, wins yep. it back, and then carries it into WrestleMania 6. Yeah. So when was kind of a side tangent here, but when was the yep. Ultimate Warrior's debut? Um in 88. It was okay. during this year. I don't think he had debuted yet. Let's see. Let me think WrestleMania 4. I don't think he wrestled at WrestleMania 4. So it was sometime Right after WrestleMania four, mm -hmm. um, those of you out there who are listening, give me a shout out at Chris Belcher twenty four. If I'm wrong and the Ultimate Warrior did wrestle on WrestleMania four, I don't think so. I could be wrong, but right. Um, so he debuts in eighty eight. Yeah. Um, around because he goes, he and Sting are a tag team in the early to mid eighties. They split up and Warrior goes to Dallas in the mid 80s. And then from yep. the Dallas territory, he comes here. So I think it's around 88. Maybe he's already debuted and he's just not on the pay per views or on the main cards yet. And they're, right. you know, getting him in house shows and syndicated matches and all that kind of stuff. Well, cause the reason why I ask is when, when did Triple H debut as Hunter Hearst Helmsley? Uh, that was 95. Five. 95 so this was before so it, basically we can kind of see a trend of the ultimate warrior from squashing the honky tonk man to win this to oh, yeah. no selling the triple h pedigree which still to this day well is listen there's there's ridiculous. so there's there is so much more that goes into that with the ultimate warrior and again not yeah. to totally sidebar on this but I, I think it's you know you're asking a question i think it's relevant <laughs> the ultimate warrior after he feuds uh in the middle of his feud with, I think I'm getting this timeline right. He feuded with Andre mm -hmm. on some house shows. Andre hated Warrior, could oh, not yeah. stand him. 
Most and people did. Like you said, because he was not great in the ring. He didn't want to have mm-hmm. long matches, which was great for Andre, but like Andre was legit hurt warrior in the ring. <laughs> so <laughs> you got Warrior who wrestled probably his best match ever against Hogan at WrestleMania yep. six. And then he had some lengthy matches as the WWE champion, but he you're right, he was always marching to the beat of his own drum. Warrior yep. did his own thing. Warrior you know, things went the way the warrior wanted them to go or they weren't going to go at all. Yeah. I think, I think the perfect, one of the perfect documentaries to watch, obviously the one that the, the dark side of the ring did on the mm-hmm. ultimate warrior. Cause that's, that's really eye opening. Cause like, obviously for someone like me who, you know, not necessarily that I don't care about the eighties and nineties wrestling. Cause obviously I do. Cause it's a massive part of the history, but right. I've tried to sit through one ultimate warrior match and can't really sit through it because it's, they're basically almost unwatchable at this point. Um, sure. And so the, like getting introduced to him in the dark side of the ring, obviously I've heard all the rumors and heard all the things. And one thing I did not know is that at the hall of fame induction ceremony, Jake, the snake Robert had quarters in his pocket, ready to <laughs> go knock out the ultimate warrior yep. for all the things that he did to him. But because yeah, that, they that's... were supposed to have a big world title feud. That's who warrior was yep. supposed to feud with after Hogan and it didn't happen. And yep. Jake blamed Warrior for that. Yeah. And, so, you know, if you watch Dark Side of the Ring, a lot of that was probably Warrior's fault. Right. I don't remember all the details, but, you know, at the Hall of Fame ceremony, just to put everybody's mind at ease, Jake did not get to use the quarters on Warrior. <laughs> Instead, Warrior apologized, apologized to him first yep. and, you know, squashed everything. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that kind of, obviously, the, the, the tragedy of the Ultimate Warrior um, and just how obviously coming back to the WWE in 2014, I think to do the yes. hall of fame. Yep. He cuts that honestly, a really great promo <laughs> on Monday night raw yep. and then passes away the next day when, and, and a tragic, a tragic thing. Yep. Um, but you know, it, I'm, it, it's good that we got to see the redemption of him kind of towards the end of his life. Um, yep. and I think the dark side of the ring really portrayed that really well, um, as well in their documentary. So if you want to get more information on the ultimate warrior, I think that's, that's a great place to, to go all right so before we uh dive into the main event of the main event which is i love saying that um (laughs) if you are now just stumbling upon the pipe bomb wrestling podcast welcome this is our old school monday edition where we were talking about the most watched wrestling event in history um the main event uh featuring hulk hogan and andre the giant we're getting ready to jump into that main event but Make sure that you leave a like, a comment, share, and subscribe on Bodyslam.net YouTube channel. Um, make sure you like or make sure you leave that five star review on any podcast platform that you're listening to the audio um, form as well. Uh, we drop uh, episodes every Monday and Wednesday. Mondays are our old school episodes. Wednesday are is our new school episodes. And every once in a while, we get cheeky and drop a bonus episode here and there when the wrestling world decides to blow up and we have too much content and can't cover it in an hour. So. That's happened a lot more recently than kind of ever before, and I don't think it's going to slow down anytime soon. So it's going to be a lot of fun to dive into that. And as always, I am joined by the OG host of the Pipe Bomb Wrestling Podcast, Chris Belcher. And we are diving into the main event of main event. We are talking about Hulk Hogan and Andre the Giant. Obviously, the infamous finish of this match is kind of what people take away from it the most. Yep. We'll get to We'll get to that segment here in a little bit. Um, but kind of, you know... Obviously, you're not a massive Hogan fan. Never have been. Uh, I've never claimed to be a Hogan fan um, ever. I, I mean, obviously, I pop when his music hits, and I'm like, yeah, sure. oh, wait, it's Hogan. Um, so I, I think that's kind of the, the MO with him today. But honestly, this match is kind of a lot of fun to kind of sit back and watch. I think the chemistry between Hogan and Andre is amazing, especially for the 80s. The, the chemistry between the two of them is really a lot of fun to see because there's always there's always guys that when they work to like guys that can work with everybody, but then you get guys that like a Triple H and a Shawn Michaels when they get in the ring together, it's just absolute magic that takes yep. place or happen. I think you can kind of put Hogan and Andre in that category as well. Sure you um, can. Uh, you you've obviously there have been multiple matches between the two of them. Um, where do you kind of put this one specifically though? Out of not necessarily all the Hogan and Andre matches, but maybe between the two that are linked together, right? Um, between the Body Slam one and then this one, kind of where do you 
put it between the two of them. Well, first of all, to to piggyback on what you said about their chemistry, you're exactly right about Hogan and Andre's chemistry. They've wrestled more than the two times that everybody really knows. Yeah. You know, obviously we know about WrestleMania three and we know about this match, but guys, these guys went around the horn in the late seventies <laughs> and early eighties when Andre stud his huge Afro and Andre could go and Hogan was not red and yellow Hogan. Uh, Hogan was managed by classy Freddie Blassie. He was a heel. Andre was a baby face. I think there's a famous Shea Stadium match that may or may not be on Peacock. You might have to dig around to find it. Um, but I'm sure there's some stuff on YouTube that you can check out. So these guys, not only did they have great chemistry in the ring, they were best of friends outside the ring. Hogan and Andre were, were as close as brothers. And you can see that. When you go watch the Andre two-hour special that HBO did, uh, was that three years ago? 2018? I think it was 2018 when they did Something it. Something yeah. like that, yep. Go find that because it's incredibly fascinating. And Hogan really opens up about his friendship with Andre and, and some of the things that they did. And so great chemistry in the ring, like you just mentioned with Triple H yep. and Shawn Michaels, it starts outside of the ring. So these guys yep. having great chemistry and – I attribute, while, while you were talking about Andre and, and that kind of thing, the first name that popped in my mind was Brock Lesnar. A Brock Lesnar match is only as good as Brock Lesnar <laughs> wants it to exactly, be. Exactly, exactly. An Andre match is only as good as, as Andre good as wants Andre. it yep. to be. So, yep. um, that being said, as far as the two matches go, man, it's tough to rank them. It really is, because WrestleMania three is the biggest one of the biggest WrestleManias of all time, like you mentioned in our open, the body slam is shown at every Everywhere. WWE event and the yep. intro video. It's right there. But then yep. you fast forward to the rematch here. And while the match didn't last as long, the match had 33 million people watching it. <laughs> 33 million people. Let me put that yep. into context for you. The NBA Finals that year between the Lakers, Magic Johnson, and all that fun mm -hmm. jazz, they played the Pistons in the 88 Finals. They got a they got 21 million viewers. Jeez. 21. This Jeez. event got 33 million viewers. 15.2 rating. 15.2. Yeah. Just let that sink in for a minute. So... And and I know a lot of people will argue like it was on free TV, so you know that obviously that played a part in it. But even then, I know there was wasn't as many channels. People still had to decide. Well, it's yep. on. Let's watch it. So like that Absolutely. that's that's a huge part and a testament to the star power of Hogan and the star power of Andre. I think I think in weighing all of those things, I'm going to say this one was more important. Even though WrestleMania put Hogan on the map because he he slayed the giant. That was the one guy that he hadn't beaten yet. Right. So I think that was incredibly important. But I think this one right here is more important just because of the way that it was all set up. And what people have to remember is this night ended a four year championship reign for Hulk Hogan. This night, he won the title in January of 84 and he did not lose it until this night. <laughs> My gosh, that's crazy. Yep. That's absolutely, I mean, it's obviously it's the Hogan effect, but yep. I, like it's still, that's really impressive that uh, he held that title for that long. Didn't get yep. injured for that long. All nope. of that. That's really interesting. So let, let's kind of dive into the match itself. Um, as per usual for most Hogan matches and yep. probably Andre matches as well. The first five to 10 minutes of the match is just them playing to the crowd yep. the entire time and yep. credit to Hogan, obviously the biggest wrestling star of the eighties um, and probably the early nineties as well. Yep. He, mm -hmm. he has the crowd in the palm of his hand yep. every single second that he yep. is on screen. He has the crowd in the palm of his hand and credit to Andre. Andre played up the monster heel bad guy role as perfectly as anybody else could as well. So, yep. um, you know, <clears throat> kind of, the Hogan effect had really taken off here. The Hogan rise, I guess, has really, like you said, WrestleMania three is where Hogan really started to become Hulk Hogan, like the Hogan yep. that we know. Um, and he is playing it up here. Obviously, his entire WWF run, he 
he plays it up and then he goes to WCW and is a different version, but a, a the same version, but a different version at the same time, which right. is really impressive that he was able to do that. Yep. Um, kind of walk us through and talk us, talk to us about the, the reason why and kind of how Hogan was able to be such a crowd favorite while also, you know, being in there with Andre and making Andre feel like a star at the same time. Well, as I mentioned, Andre is only going to do what Andre wants to do. And yeah. Andre saw the potential in Hulk Hogan. Um, uh, the infamous story, the way it goes is at WrestleMania three, Hogan didn't know the finish when he got in the ring. Mm -hmm. It was all Andre. <laughs> Andre was calling the match. Andre called the slam. Andre called the leg drop. Andre didn't kick out. That was Hogan legit didn't know. Was the Hogan finish. supposed to win? He didn't know. Wow. Now he didn't know. Now Andre and Vince had obviously planned out what was going to happen. Right. But Hogan didn't know. Hogan was apparently left in the dark. Um, but I say all that to say Hogan wins the title in January of 84 and Hulkamania takes off. WrestleMania is what it is because of Hulk Hogan and the partnership with Mr. T and they right. were doing the rock and wrestling stuff on MTV with Cindy Lauper at the time. So Hogan became this huge star in the media world because the WWF had that reach. Now, Ric Flair was doing his thing down south and he was a household name down south and winning all these championships and, and yada, yada, yada. But he didn't have the reach that Vince right. McMahon and that Hulk Hogan did. So the modern world, this was their first real exposure to wrestling because nobody had ever taken a chance on gl going global before. Like it was right. all territorial still in the eighties. It was a lot of territories and such when Vince took a chance on taking his company national and making it a big, a big deal. Hulk Hogan was at the centerpiece of that. So yeah. I don't necessarily think it was something that Hogan did per se, but I honestly think it was the right place. At the right time. Hogan yeah. was the big jacked up dude. I think if, Honestly, I know a lot of people may, you know, send me some hate tweets for this at Chris Welch 24. <laughs> I think if the ultimate warrior would have been in this position, he would be just as talked about as Hulk Hogan. I think it was, yeah. I think it was right place, right time for Hogan because he was the centerpiece of this, of this global phenomenon that was starting to happen. Now, warrior couldn't act like Hogan. Right. Warrior didn't have the character that Hogan did. He didn't have the relatability of Hogan. What I'm saying is, I'm not saying that anybody could have filled this role that Hulk Hogan did, but I think if, if somebody else could have been as popular, had they been able to be that centerpiece. Yeah, and I think I think part of the the draw about Hogan, I would say more so than the Ultimate Warrior, was Hogan's promo ability. Sure. Oh, absolutely. Was yeah. was yep. ten times better than the yep. Ultimate Warrior. So I think. Oh yeah. I think that kind of played more to the fact of I, I would honestly say if Ric Flair had been in Hogan's position, Flair would be. I mean, obviously Flair is. If you go back and listen to our Mount Rushmore episode that we did, Flair was in all four of our Mount Rushmores of pro wrestling. So he's obviously already there. But I'm saying that I think you could have built that company also around Ric Flair. Sure. And then it would be as big, if I, I would almost argue maybe even a little bigger during that time period well, because of the wrestling ability more than right than just a pretty face that could cut a promo at the same time. Well, and the argument for me to that is like you could plug in the Macho Man in this, but <laughs> Macho Man was barely six foot, maybe six right. one, and was two hundred and twenty pounds, two hundred thirty pounds, and he wasn't the and same with flair. They weren't the prototypical exactly. wrestler that you think of. So I think that's another reason that I mentioned warrior because he looked the part as well. Yeah. Hogan yeah. absolutely looked the part. So I think that while macho and while flair had the success in the ring, you needed the prototypical wrestler to fit the mold. Absolutely. And, and that's, that's where Hogan came in. Absolutely. And that Hogan, Hogan checked every single box and yeah, he did. 
other than necessarily the wrestling ability, I think he excelled yep. <laughs> every every check of that box as well. Yep. Um, but you can't you can't leave out Andre in this as well because sure. he had to play his part in being. For every Batman, there has to be a Joker, and obviously Andre for this portion of of the WWF was Hogan's Joker of nope. the guy that he struggled to beat or the guy that he always had trouble beating, and that that's always the most interesting fact. I mean, we talked about it on the Rumble, a uh, Royal Rumble podcast or uh, uh, pre uh, review episode. There we go. I finally got it out. That like Roman and Seth. Seth is the Joker to Batman to Roman's Batman, and they yep. even like portrayed that on screen with Seth coming out and playing mind games and everything else. So sure. that that's the that's the fun aspect I think of this match is uh, Hogan and Andre being the two polar opposites, having that chemistry together in the ring, absolutely killing it together. Right, and and one thing to mention, you know, not to look over this. WrestleMania three was quote unquote Andre's first career loss. You know, not yeah. many people ever had seen Andre pinned until WrestleMania three. So that was huge. Um, right. So yes, you're right. Andre was the, was the perfect guy, the perfect foil to uh, send Hulk Hogan into the stratosphere. Right. All right. Let's, let's talk about the finish to this match. Cause obviously the finish is um, extremely it's why well we're known. Here. It's That's why, why we're here. We're here. Yep. Um, it is definitely a, an eighties finish. It's a weird finish that I don't think you could do today and get the same reaction or the same. I don't think it would be received as well. I think is, is the way right. that I'm, I'm going to put it. Um, <clears throat> you have a really weird transition where it seemed like Andre just kind of threw Hogan and just kind of plopped on top of him. Right. Um, and then you have the three count one, two Hogan, obviously kicked out the ref never even looked up, counted three. Yep. The double referee shenanigans between Earl Hebner and his brother, I Dave. his brother's name, Dave. Yep. Um, yeah, kind of walk us through the, the finish of, of the match. Obviously, it's you couldn't have Hogan basically get beat clean um, right. and lose the title, which I kind of get, but also you held the thing for four years, so it wouldn't hurt to lose clean. <laughs> um, <laughs> so kind of just walk us through the finish, kind of walk us through the aftermath of... Yep the double referee thing. And, and yep. um, you know, obviously you can also talk about Andre selling the title to Ted DiBiase that same night. And then kind of going from, from there, this, this main event and the finish was so all over the place and extremely right. interesting at the same time. Well, you have to look at, you have to not, you can't have a clean finish when, with Hogan losing the title, because we already have the tournament planned for WrestleMania four. So you have to right. find a way to hold the title up. And um, then paying off the ref, doing the quote unquote plastic surgery angle that Hogan refers to afterwards, uh, which is really interesting. Um, I'm surprised that Vince and Jesse didn't mention that at all on their commentary, but they did not. Hogan mentions it in his promo afterwards. Um, so you had that, and then you have Andre selling the championship over to DiBiase, which causes right. it to to be vacated but yeah i mean this is one of the more creative finishes that you'll ever see in yep. wrestling because of the timing of it like you said we probably would not see this in 2022 you could try it um but getting away with it would be very very interesting yeah um so the the plot of the whole thing was that earl hebner worked for the nwa at the time and dave hebner worked for the wwf Mm -hmm. Dave had been refereeing for a long time and wanted to transition into a backstage role, which from here on out, if you look at any time that backstage personnel get involved, you'll always see Dave Hebner. So right. he makes the transition. So what they do is they bring Earl in and they call him Dave because obviously they're twin brothers and they don't right. know. Like, in fact, Jesse Ventura on commentary when the match starts, he alluded to Joey Morella being the referee at WrestleMania three and missing when Andre quote had Hogan beat at WrestleMania three. He said, we've got Dave Hebner in the ring tonight. We're not going to have any of those shenanigans. <laughs> he's going to know what he's doing. Great commentary by Jesse right there. Exactly. So then you have obviously what you ran through. Hogan gets his shoulder up. 
Dave comes out to the ring. So it's Earl refing in the beginning, but they call him Dave. Dave comes out to the ring, and then we have all the shenanigans and everything like that. Fun fact, in the aftermath of this, Earl starts refereeing, Dave transitions to backstage, and they call him uh, Dave on screen for a long time just huh. so that because it was the real Dave Hebner was the hero in the whole thing. He right. was he wasn't the one in the ring. So they wanted to make Earl be Dave so that there was no heat on him. And then right. obviously they could just drop it at some point. Yeah. But yeah, like like you said, something that we won't really see, you really have to watch this to get the full effect of exactly how impactful this really was. Yeah. Cause obviously you have you have both brothers at one point in the ring. Um and then Hogan is like Hogan is staring at Andre and Ted DiBiase as they're making their way out of, out of the ring, out of the, uh, down the ramp or whatever. <laughs> then Earl Hebner just starts beating up his brother, which yep. was hilarious. And then yep. Hogan starts kind of going after Earl, which is even more fun. And that's just kind of how, how it goes off the air is, yep. you know, DiBiase is now the champion. Hogan lost the championship after four years to a, a double ref count out a double ref interference or however you want to put it. And right. That's all she wrote. And then you yeah. obviously head into WrestleMania. So I don't think we would see, I, I think today, if it was going to be done, it would depend on who was in the ring and how it happened. Sure. <laughs> Is how it would have to work. And I think, I think that's the case here. I think if it was anybody else other than Andre and Hogan, I don't think this would have worked as well right. as, as it did, you know, during this time period. Well, I mean, if you listen to Bruce Pritchard's podcast again, I'll I'll reference that. He talks about he is just he is fresh into the company at this point. He's yeah. not even been with the company for the for a year by this time. And he's running backstage and he's still trying to navigate the waters or whatever. And Vince comes up to him before the show starts and he says, You know what we're doing tonight? Bruce says, Yeah. And he says, Do you know the finish of Hogan Andre? And he said, Yeah, we're switching the title. Vince said, do you want to know how? And Bruce said, no, I do not. I want to watch it. And Vince just kind of chuckled and said, okay. So Bruce, <laughs> to hear him talk about his reaction watching it, it's like he thinks it's literally the single greatest finish of all time. But obviously, I think that's his perspective of right how he was there and how it happened in front of him or whatever. But we've seen Eric Bischoff dress up as a priest and us not know it's him. We've seen some crazy stuff like that. So I think with the way that masks and makeup and all that stuff is done nowadays, yeah. okay, you maybe could pull it off, but like you said, it would have to be the perfect storm depending on who's in the ring and that kind of deal. Yeah, absolutely. Um, <clears throat> so you kind of kind of walk me through some other things too because I have, on, on the Peacock version, I don't know if this is how it came out, which I'm, I'm sure it is. After... The Hogan Andre match. Mm -hmm. Then we get the Heart Foundation. Yes. Versus Strike Force. Yeah. But they have the Hogan promo in between, ba yep. uh, right before basically. So kind of walk us through the promo and then why why was the main event not necessarily the main event of <laughs> of the show? Well, I think I, I think it just goes to show you the way that we always see wrestling tv these days what you see right before it goes off the air is typically not the main event of the show if you go to wrestling shows you get a dark match or two after the show's off the air and i think this is kind of what this was um because they only had an hour so they wanted to make sure they had enough time to do all this explain it all come back from commercial and have hogan cut his promo to you know, especially since Vince and Jesse didn't mention the plastic surgery angle on commentary, you had Hogan, you know, saying all that and clearing that up, that kind of thing. So I think it's just a matter of how much time they had timing out the whole show. And then, yeah, you get strike force and the heart foundation. And I think they had another match after that, but obviously it didn't make air. So what we see on Peacock is the way that it aired originally in 88 on NBC. It was just a matter of where their focus was, um, making you want to tune in for more, especially as you see, oh, there's another match. I want to know what happened, yada, yada, yada. Oh, it's going off the air. You got to tune in next time. 
So I think it was, I think it was a strategy of that. I don't think it was a flub up of of any kind. I think it was just the way that they wanted to, to leave people hanging. You know what I mean? Yeah. And I just thought it was really interesting that as basically as they were fading to black, the heart foundation gets pinned <laughs> yes. and then it fades to black. And then, you know, that's the end of the show. So, well, and you gotta, you gotta think too, just like with dark matches in today's wrestling, you send the crowd home. Happy crowd yeah. ain't going home. Happy with Hogan and Andre. It's not no. going to happen, you know, no. and they only had an hour. And so I'm, I'm, I think they had a got like I said, a couple matches after that. Yeah. Um, but I, I do think it's interesting the way that they structured it for TV uh, I would like to know the nuts and bolts of that. I'm not aware of that, but I think mm-hmm. it's more of just, hey, we're we're still on the air. Let's go ahead and show this, but we got to get Hogan in there. Yeah, absolutely. I I completely agree. All right, anything else you want to add about the main event before we before we put a bow on this old school edition episode? Let me look through my notes here and see if there was something else that I wrote <laughs> down that I uh, could not fit in there. Uh, no, the only thing that I didn't fit in, we kind of glossed over the Hulk Hogan training montage at the beginning. Yeah. Um, <laughs> What you may not have noticed and what our listeners or viewers may not have noticed is that Hogan's training montage, the music behind the training montage. Mm-hmm. Jake the Snake Roberts theme music. Is it really? Yep. Why? Because it, in in Bruce Pritchard's words, because it sounded cool. Yep. (laughs) Okay. Yep. Yep. So, fun fact. I thought the music was completely out of place for the the montage that they were going for. Yeah, I know. Me too. Uh, That's so weird. Yep. That is so weird. Jake the Snake Roberts theme music. Yep. Sure was. That is so weird. Oh my god. But gosh. no, man, the... I I really uh, I think this is this is way out of left field for us to do on this podcast, but I yeah. love it. Yeah. Because 33 million viewers for this primetime show in 1988. I mean, holy cow. We'll never be touched again by any wrestling show of all time, any ever. Won't yeah. be touched. It just yeah. won't. So this event and its impact on the wrestling business, we're coming up on the anniversary of it. I think it was February uh, 5th, February 5th. So that would have been Mm, Saturday. It would have been Saturday Saturday, tomorrow as we record this Saturday, if you're listening on Monday. Um, So it's an anniversary. That's why we want to talk about it. The 33 year anniversary of it. Um, But it's just so impactful and it's something totally off the wall and something interesting that we need to go back and educate Andy and educate <laughs> some of our younger listeners and remind the older listeners that, you know, wrestling is still, I mean, like, listen, we just got through discussing a double ref quote unquote, plastic <laughs> surgery storyline. I mean, come on. Like it, that it, it is as ridiculous as it sounds. Yes, it is. Just like a lot of stuff that we see now that is ridiculous as it sounds. Yes, it is. Sami Zayn trying to do all of Johnny Knoxville stunts and all this. It's stupid. <laughs> yeah. So is this, but it's <laughs> wrestling. <laughs> exactly. So, I mean, it's, it's a lot of fun to, to go way, way back and, and check out some of these things and bring it to, to you guys on the podcast. Absolutely. I completely agree. Well, that's going to do it for this Monday edition of the Pipe Bomb Wrestling Podcast. Make sure you tune in this Wednesday as we're going to be diving into all the current product things. We're going to be talking about the amazing main event from AEW Dynamite with CM Punk versus MJF in Chicago. Um, It's going to be a lot of fun to talk about that. Also, the fallout um, from the Royal Rumble on Friday Night SmackDown, as well as kind of building towards the Elimination Chamber. Um, Holy Monday crap, man. Yeah. Well. Elimination it's, Chamber it's, is not that far away. It's two weeks? Two and a half weeks. Yeah. Two, two and, and a half, half weeks. weeks. Yeah. That's, and, that's a quick turnaround. And let's, let's go ahead and plug next Monday's episode if you're an old school fan. Yep. Um, we are going to be recapping St. Valentine's Day <laughs> Massacre, <laughs> the In Your House from February of 1999. Yep. That is Steve Austin and Vince McMahon in a steel cage in the debut, debut of the big show. Yep. So, so it's going to be that, a lot of fun. 
that that is next week and and there's probably andy hinted at it earlier it's probably a bonus episode coming your way in the next two weeks as well so <laughs> get ready for that be prepared for that be ready for that well uh thank you once again for tuning in and listening to us whether this is your first time or your hundredth time we appreciate it like i said before make sure you hit that subscribe button to bodyslam.net's youtube channel uh, make sure you like, share, subscribe, do all of that fun stuff. Comment down below as well. Um, make sure that you go over to SportsWire, uh, Sportinarium.com, so that you can listen to our episodes. Our new episodes are every Monday and Wednesday, or Monday and Wednesday there as well. So definitely go check them out. Plus, give a listen to all of their other amazing shows um, on their platform as well. Also, if you're listening to this on a uh, traditional audio form, whether that's Spotify, Apple Podcast, Google Play. Um, basically any way you find your podcast, uh, make sure you leave that five star review and make sure you comment as well. If you can, uh, make sure you do all the things you can do for the podcast because we want to grow and expand and do more episodes like this and have a lot more fun. And, uh, you know, we're enjoying the, the wrestling world right now and going back and looking at a lot of things and, you know, Chris is going to get better and better as we go along. It is. It really is. I mean, this podcast is for the fans by the fans and, we want to talk about what you guys want to hear about. So if you guys don't want to hear anything else from 1988, <laughs> tell us you don't want to hear anything from 1988. That's yep. fine. But, um, yeah, we're, we're, we're here for you guys. We're wrestling fans just like you. Uh, it, it's a lot of fun. Obviously, WrestleMania season is always fun. So it's a great time to be a new listener if you are or if you're a longtime listener. Uh, don't go away just yet. There's a lot of good stuff coming your way. Absolutely. Well, For Chris, I'm Andy York. Thank you once again for tuning in and listening to us, and we'll catch you guys down the road.